talking a little bit more about what, what their team do. Um, and Camilla in the background, who's our awards assistant, who's supporting our um, event um, today. So um, to start us off, um, Today, we are going to be giving you, um, I guess, some initial first steps to start in this process. Because uh, there's lots of research to do prior to um, even getting to the stage of applying for a Fulbright Award. We want you to be thinking about what's the right choice for you in terms of all the opportunities there are in the US. So we're hoping to basically use this session today to signpost a lot of our resources um, and information on our website. And the second part of our session, we'll be having a panel with some Fulbrighters who have got, been through the process and can share some of their experiences with you. And later on in the um, upcoming months, we'll be doing a much more uh, deeper dive into the um, information about making an application and how to, um, I guess, prepare and make yourself a competitive application. Um, and we'll also be hearing from panels from our alumni network and affinity groups later on as well. So there's plenty of information that's gonna be shared with you um, to try and make this as easy process as possible. Um, so, Fulbright is a global um, organization and there's lots of countries and people involved. So to begin us off, I was going to share a video with you which summarizes things quite nicely. So if you bear with me one moment. Thank you. After graduating from college, James William Fulbright left his home in Arkansas to embark on a journey across the Atlantic. He studied at Oxford University, traveled throughout Europe, and learned about the lives and concerns of the people he met along the way. But the results of this transformational overseas experience would not fully emerge for another 20 years. After Fulbright returned to the United States, he attended law school, served as a university president, and began a career in public service. In 1945, as the junior senator from Arkansas, he introduced legislation to use funds from surplus war materials for a new international educational exchange program. In 1946, President Harry Truman signed legislation to establish the Fulbright Program, an international scholarship with an ambitious goal to increase mutual understanding and support friendly and peaceful relations between the people of the United States and the people of other countries. Today, through an annual appropriation from the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Department of State sponsors Fulbright program exchanges with more than 155 countries around the world. The State Department manages the overall program, sets priorities, allocates resources, and funds the Fulbright program's day-to-day -day administration by non-governmental organizations, such as IIE and CIES. In each country, the State Department's U.S. Embassy staff works with partner governments to provide in-country oversight for the Fulbright program. In some countries, the two governments have established independent bi-national Fulbright commissions to carry out the program. Finally, the presidentially appointed Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board establishes policies and procedures and selects participants for the Fulbright program. Worldwide, most of the funding for the Fulbright program comes from the U.S. government while many foreign governments contribute substantially to the program as well. Higher education institutions, both in the U.S. and abroad, also play an important role, sharing costs and serving as centers of academic and professional development for Fulbrighters. Private organizations and individual donors provide additional funding and in-kind support. Through this cooperation among governments, academia, the private sector, and civil society, the Fulbright program increases international understanding and responds to critical global issues. Fulbrighters the world over are engaged in projects on environmental issues, food security, public health, education, and other challenges that require innovation, creativity, and knowledge that transcends borders. So what does it mean to be a Fulbrighter? Fulbrighters are current and future leaders who are ready to share their knowledge and culture, who are open to new ideas, and who are committed to international engagement. Fulbright alumni have gone on to become Nobel Prize winners, heads of state, ambassadors, leaders in scientific research and innovation, educators, artists, business professionals, and civic leaders. Above all, Fulbrighters exemplify the power of international academic exchange to transform lives, bridge geographic and cultural boundaries, and promote a more peaceful and prosperous world. Okay, so 
it's going to close that. Okay, um, so, um, so as, oh, <laughs> sorry, let's close that now. There we go. Um, so as you heard in the video, this is a global um, organization and the US is basically, um, all the exchanges happen between the US and other countries and we're the US UK branch and we're one of the commissions that they mentioned where um, the UK government and the Welsh government and the Scottish government um, make a contribution to. So we have our own commission, the US UK Fulbright Commission, and we have our own board who um, meet quarterly throughout the year to help us set our strategic goals and support all of our work. So at the US UK Fulbright Commission, our mission here is to advance knowledge, promote civic engagement and develop compassionate leaders um, to exchange between the peoples of the US and the UK. And how do we do that? Um, we award Fulbright grants to American and British students seeking to do postgraduate study um, in the US and the UK and to um, scholars. So our academics, professionals, all the way from early career to um, right towards the end of their career. Um, to do research in, in each other's country. We also partner with the Sutton Trust to support high achieving state school students to uh, explore the possibility of studying in the US and help them um, uh, gain financial aid. And we also work with UK universities to bring American students, undergraduate students who've never left the US to come and do a summer institutes program in the UK. And finally, we partner with Education USA who offer um, programs, events and advice for UK students um, thinking about studying in the US. And we have Sarah today from Education USA who'll be talking a little bit more about that piece. So of our work, the areas of interest I think for our audience today is of course um, our Fulbright Awards, which are our scholarships and the Education USA, which is um, a great resource when you're navigating the huge volume of uh, options in the US. Now, um, Sam's gonna be talking a little bit about the actual scholarships. Um, and of course, uh, one huge benefit to Fulbright is just receiving the, the financial support to actually go to the US in the first place and the pastoral support to, to help you navigate what can feel quite a daunting experience at the beginning to make it as um, smooth as possible. Um, but another um, piece to this that sometimes people take for granted is, um, which I'm gonna talk about now, is actually the, uh, much longer lasting benefit, which is uh, entering that community of really fantastic, um, accomplished uh, individuals of our global Fulbright community, uh, who are representing different nationalities, all different backgrounds, different disciplines, and have lots of passion and interest. And they all have um, certain things in, in common in relation to being open-minded and collaborative. And as such, the, the network's really vibrant and energetic. Um, uh, so if you explore our website, you'll be able to um, see some of our um, recipients of awards so you can get to know um, get to know them. Later on, we're also going to have um, some of our alums available on our website to receive questions about their experience, uh, which will be on our website. And those of you on our mailing list now will make sure that you're aware of this. And here's some of our Fulbrighters who received our Alumni Fulbright Award. Um, quite recently, um, and also you can explore if you go to um, alumni, uh, sorry, about us, uh, meet our four writers, you can also um, see all of our previous cohorts as well, just to get a feel for the kinds of things, all the different uh, backgrounds they're coming from and the different things that they're doing. Um, and as soon as you receive a Fulbright Award, um, you're invited to join our uh, digital networking platform, Fulbrighter, which all of our global community um, are invited to join. So um, this is a real attractive point about the Fulbright Programme. We're one of the oldest, uh, largest international global networks. So the, the Fulbright experience, as I'm sure some of our Fulbrighters are speaking um, later on in the session will attest to, is that the experience itself is transformative, but entering this supportive community is um, a huge value of becoming part of the Fulbright Programme. So um, today's session, um, you know, the this is just, the, to show you the timeline here, the applications for the awards um, don't open to August. So we're not gonna be doing a really deep dive into the details and nuts and bolts of um, making an application at this stage, because uh, in our humble opinion, we think it's um, this is the time to be researching the US and, and where you want to do your research or study um, and finding a good fit for you. And if you do the research now and, and you've done the legwork or perhaps making some connections there, 
that really comes through in, in when you do actually make an application and, and, and it's very clear what your goals are and that you've done um, an extensive um, research. So um, without further ado, I am going to hand over Sam now, who's going to talk a little bit further about the actual um, awards and um, plus some of the jargon involved with when we're talking about our scholarship programme. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Amy. Uh, as, as Amy has said, I am going to give you a bit of a rundown on, on what it is that we do and some of the language and information that you'll be hearing and just trying to open that up and make that a little bit more accessible. So we talked a little bit today about Fulbright Awards and Fulbright Awards are the academic scholarships that we provide to undertake time in the United States for UK based postgraduate scholars and professionals. So I think one of the important things to, to bust here early on is that although all of our awards provide financial support and support from the commission through the process of getting out to the states, not all of, not all of our awards are uniform. So when you go onto our website to look through our awards, make sure you understand what you're applying for because some of them will have different financial benefits, they'll have different networks that they're tied into. So it's really important to have the information that you need when you're making these applications. So. As Amy said, you can go on our website. There's lots of information here. You've got information on the people who have recently received some of our awards and, and all of the uh, recent cohorts are also available on the About Us page. But one of the things that I really wanna get into early is some of this language around postgraduate scholarships and scholar awards. Because I think when you hear about Fulbright awards, either in the media or when you do some of the reading, it's really common to see the phrase Fulbright scholarships or Fulbright scholars as if these are all just one thing. And one of the really important things to note is that we actually differentiate here and a lot of the Fulbright programs differentiate when it comes to awarding these awards between postgraduates and scholars. And that's one of the first things that I wanna talk about here today. So postgraduate awards are the awards that you'll be applying for if you're seeking a degree at the end of your program. So that might be a master's or a PhD, something along those lines, and that funding can be can be used to support your time at any accredited postgraduate university in America. Postgraduate awards also support PhD students who are based in the UK, but who are looking to take some time out of, out of their PhD work to go and do research in America. So there's maybe if you need access to a specific lab, or if there's an archive that you want to use, that's a great use of one of those visiting researcher, PhD researcher scholarships. But we also have our scholar awards, and these are a little bit more open in terms of where some of those boundaries and definitions are, but these are three to 12 month funds for academics. So people who have finished their PhD or professionals working in fields like medicine or in certain government bodies to go to the US to undertake three to 12 months worth of research and or teaching at any US institution. And, and knowing which of those categories you fit into is going to be an important first step because you don't want to put in all of this work and find out you've applied for the wrong program. So knowing that you're you're either on that postgraduate or scholar track is going to be important early on here. When uh, when looking at these awards, so, so here we've got our information about what our postgraduate awards contain. So for instance, we've got financial contributions, some sick, sickness and accident cover, sponsorship for your J-1 visa, which is really important, and then support while you're in the US from the Institute of International Education, plus programming from the Fulbright Commission uh, leading up to that departure. So all of that's important to know. And we've got some eligibility requirements. But on this page as well, you can go on to awards available, and you will be able to see the different awards that we offer to our postgraduates. So Currently, these are the awards from the last time the applications are open. So these won't give you a, the best sense of what will be available come August, but what you'll be able to do is get a sense of what kind of awards we tend to offer. And, and this leads me on to a really nice little second distinction when it comes to what awards you might want to apply for. So we have two different varieties of awards for both postgraduates and scholars that it's it's worth thinking about which you may want to apply for. So we have our All Disciplines Award and we have our Partner Awards. So the majority of the awards that you'll see on this awards available page are Partner Awards. The All Disciplines Award is, is not restricted to any university and it's not restricted to any academic field. 
Whereas some of these partner awards may have specific fields that they want people to, to be involved with, like the, the Elsevier Data Analytics Award, for instance, requires someone to want to do some study relating to data analytics or the, the BAFTA scholarship probably relates to, to media, right? Whereas others, for instance, the, uh, the Maurer Law School Award, that's related to a specific institution. So if you're, if you're looking for, for doing an award that doesn't restrict your field or your institution, then you'll be looking at all disciplines award. But if you're interested in some of these specific schools, some of these, these prestigious schools that have sponsored our awards, or you have an, an area of interest academically that, that is covered by one of these awards, then you may want to look at these partner awards. And, and there's a different benefits to each. As I've mentioned, there's a lot more freedom with the All Disciplines Award. But the partner awards, because they're a lot more specific, a lot more dialed in to, to wanting to do a certain thing, there tends to be a little bit less competition because you're not competing against people from a whole wide variety of fields looking at different universities. So it can be a competitive edge sometimes if you're applying for a partner award. Plus, often you'll have extra networks you might be a part of and maybe may be different benefits from the partner, the sponsoring partner. So often worth looking at those for those reasons too. And it's not just the postgraduate awards that have these, we also have them for the scholar awards. These tend to be backed here a lot more often by, uh, for instance, nonprofit organizations and, and charitable bodies like the Urology Foundation or uh, professional bodies like the Royal College of Surgeons. But again, take a look at these because you may find something that, that applies really nicely to you and can give you that competitive edge during your application. Next thing to talk about is the instructions. So if you, for instance, are on our postgraduate scholarship page for, for our awards, you might go through. So we've looked at awards available and the next page to, to think about is how to apply. We've got some information here about putting together a competitive application. But the other part of this that is, is worth noting is we have a link here to our instructions. So here we have our UK specific application instructions. There's application instructions for both P, uh, postgraduates and for scholars. So make sure you're looking at the right ones. These are country specific instructions and it's really important you read these, understand them and follow them when you're submitting your application. They'll clear up a lot of the questions that you may have at this stage and through the application period. But it's also worth noting that these are our country specific instructions. So if you are applying from the UK for a UK, US UK Fulbright Award, these are the instructions you need to follow. And, and why am I emphasizing this? Well, as, as Amy said, and as you heard in the video, Fulbright is a global program. So when you go to make an application on the, on the application site, when that's open, that site it works for all of the programs globally, which means there'll be information on that application that won't be relevant to you. And we often get, we every year without fail, we'll get questions about, oh, the application says, I shouldn't write about this, but your instructions say that I should. Which do I follow? The answer is always to follow the country specific applications. These are specifically for the applications we will receive. So make sure you're following these application instructions because otherwise your application may actually not be eligible within our system, or you may have lost the competitive edge by following the international instructions rather than seeing specifically what the US UK Fulbright Commission is looking for. So it's really important that you find this document, read it and understand it before starting that application. The other thing that I want to talk about, and there's there's information about this on that page, the how to apply page, is what a competitive application looks like. So I don't want to get too far into this right now because this will be what some of our future webinars will be about. But there are some things you can be thinking about at this stage already. So obviously applications don't open until August. So not all of this is things to, to be thinking about in depth, but right now some of the things you can be doing to prepare yourself are researching what it is that you want to apply for. So going through those partner awards, again, not all of them will be available, but they should give you a good idea of what will be available and researching what institutions you, you want to do your Fulbright at. So for postgraduates, that means where am I going to be applying to my master's or all my PhD? And for scholars, that means which departments will I be reaching out for to affiliate, reaching out to, to affiliate myself with for my research or my teaching? 
And doing that research now is going to be really important because you do need that affiliation, whether it's an application submitted as a postgraduate or a letter from the department as a scholar, you will need to include that in your application. So make sure you're doing that research now, especially because the, the universities that you're affiliating yourself with will be something that our, our application readers pay attention to. And, and often they're looking at people who have put in their research and know where it is they want to go and why they want to go. At this stage, you may not have a great sense of what universities there are in the US, especially offering postgraduate degrees. So it may be easy to default to somewhere that you've heard of, somewhere prestigious. But there are lots of prestigious universities that you won't have heard of that may have better specialist programs in what it is that you want to do. So doing that research now is going to be really important. And that's something that my colleague Sarah is going to talk about too when I hand over to her. You also want to have a think about how you're going to write your application because there's space to write to show off a little bit of your personality, to show why the Fulbright is important to you. Because Fulbright isn't just about the academia. There's a strong sense of internationality to our awards. There's a sense of cultural curiosity that we look for, leadership, cultural ambassadorialship, and all of those things come into our awards. So having a think about how you can express those aspects of your character will also be really important in putting together a fantastic application. So with, with all that said, uh, please do go through our website to, to look at things relating to the awards that you're interested in, but also think about the resources that you can use for your research for institutions and project proposals and things like that. And uh, I'm gonna hand over to Sarah from Education USA to talk a little bit more about getting started at this stage. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so as Amy and Sam have both mentioned, um, doing your research is really important. And so I'd like to introduce myself to help you out with that. So my name is Sarah Panik, and I am an Education USA advisor at the Fulbright Commission. And what that means is that I work as part of the Education USA network, which means that we are one of over 400 advising centers in more than 178 countries throughout the world. And what we do is we provide free, unbiased, um, up-to-date advice to anybody who wants to study in the US at the undergraduate or graduate level. Um, and we are the only official source of US study in the UK. And so if your dream is to study in the US, we are here to help you with that. Um, and so we are based in the Fulbright Commission with my colleagues that offer the Fulbright Awards. Um, and we provide all sorts of advice and resources to those who are interested in studying in the US. And so I wanted to come here today to introduce myself um, and my team to you because we can actually be a really great resource for you as you are starting this choosing process. Um, one of the things that we do is we provide a lot of information and resources. And so for instance, a couple of weeks ago, my team and I led a webinar about postgrad study in the US and how to choose a university, how to fund your studies, how to put that application forward. And um, one of the things that we can do uh, after this session is we can actually send you the link to that recording that's up on YouTube. And that way you can access that recording so that you have access to that information about all of that information. But what I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about the choosing process and how to choose a university in the US because there are actually over 1,700 institutions that offer postgrad programs in the US and each institution and department will be different. So how exactly do you go about narrowing that down? Um, and one of the things that you're gonna hear a lot at the Fulbright Commission and in Education USA is this idea of fit. And what that means is not just applying to universities that you've heard of or universities that are ranked highly or maybe ones that you've heard of in movies or in television shows, but finding a university that is the best fit for you. Um, where, where are you gonna find your fit? And there's a few way, ways to do that. Um, what, the best way to do that is to consider a variety of different factors that are important to you and have a think about those factors. And that can help you kind of narrow down all of these institutions. So one of the factors that you might wish to consider is the program type and the academic department, which at the postgraduate level is arguably more important than the institution itself. In fact, the academic department is going to influence so much of your experience in the US. 
At the postgraduate level, it generally handles admissions, designs course structure um, for students, and monitors a student's progression through the program. And departments can vary drastically in areas of faculty um, expertise and the elective courses and the concentrations that they offer, whether they're tightly focused or more interdisciplinary. Um, they also vary in their size and atmosphere in their opportunities for teaching and research. Um, so those are all things that you're going to want to kind of keep in mind as you're thinking about, um, you know, the best institution for you. You're also going to want to think about location. The US is a big country covering several geographic zones. Um, you're going to want to think about if you're going to want to be in an urban area, which might be have a higher cost of living or in a suburban or a rural area. Uh, will you have access to public transportation? Will you be able to walk to, to your classes? Um, will you need a car? All those are all things that you're going to probably want to keep in mind. And then another thing that you're probably thinking about is finances. You're here today because you're interested in applying for a Fulbright Award. And if you are successful in getting that award, it can um, help fund your studies, but it might not necessarily cover the entire cost of your degree in the US. And it might be that you're looking for alternative sources of funding to kind of help make up the rest of that cost. And if funding is something that's important to you, then it needs to be part of your choosing process right from the very beginning. And because oftentimes funding, especially from funding that comes directly from universities is awarded and applied for alongside the application process. So you don't want to just start thinking about it after you've applied and been accepted, because at that point, it might already be too late and that might create disappointment, which we don't want you to feel. Um, so if you need funding to pursue postgraduate study in the US, you want to make sure that you're including that in your research process from the very start. And if you do check out that webinar that I've mentioned, um, the recorded webinar that we led a couple of weeks ago, we talk in more detail there about funding um, and how to fund your studies. So I would really recommend checking that out um, and also on our website, which I'll show you. Um, so those are all a variety of different factors that you're gonna consider in identifying your fit. Uh, and so once you've kind of thought about what factors are important to you, you can narrow down your options in a few different ways. One way is by using search engines, which I'll show you um, briefly on our website where to find those search engines. Another way is to speak to previous professors and colleagues who are in the field, see if they know of any institutions that are known in your field that would be a good fit for you, a good place for you to apply. And another thing that you can think about is the work of scholars that you've previously read. Where do they work? Um, you know, is, what are they researching right now? Is that something that you want to pursue? Is that somewhere you want to go? So those are all I, things to start thinking about in that choosing process. And as both Amy and Sam mentioned, it's really important Important that you start kind of doing that research now because you're really going to want to understand the institution that you're applying to and that can help you put forward a good application to the institution that you apply and a good application for your Fulbright award. Um, so just to reiterate, ways that we can help uh, here at the Education USA team at Fulbright, um, check out that webinar that we'll send you a link to. I'm also in a moment going to show you the Fulbright website and some resources there. Um, and then the other thing that I quickly want to mention is our advising service. So if you have any questions after you've watched the webinar, after you've checked um, through the website, read through the website, um, the Education USA team here at Fulbright provides an advising service over email and by phone. So you can email us any questions about applying to the US at advising at fulbright.org.uk. And also on Tuesday and Thursday, Thursday afternoons, we offer a phone uh, advisory service where you can phone us and ask any questions. And that number is uh, available on the website. So without further ado, I'll just quickly share my screen. Just bear with. Um, all right. So this is our our website that Amy took you through and Sam took you through different parts of. Um, and if you are looking for how to research the institutions um, and just like the whole process of applying for a degree in the US, you'll go to go, going to the USA, you'll go to this postgraduate page. And if you scroll down, you'll see we have Education USA advice here. And you'll see here we have choosing, funding, and applying, three key areas in applying for your degree. And within each section, we have more information. And on this choosing page, we have different search engines that you can use, for instance, to start some of your research. So um, 
I hope that that is some useful information and a good start. And I hope that you are able to make use of our website and watch that webinar and reach out to us if you have any further questions as you're doing your research. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to Amy, who is going to introduce the next section. Thanks very much, Sarah. That's um, great. So <clears throat> hopefully you know everything is on our website and you'll um, be making use of all of our resources. Um, so we had some questions about the follow the events later on in the upcoming months, which we'll be doing a deeper dive into sort of the nuts and bolts of our application process. Um, and because we will have all your contact details as a result of this event, unless you unsubscribe um, or tell us to delete your information, we'll basically be sending information about the upcoming events. So, um, please look out for the, that information. Um, so we're gonna be going into panels in a moment. <clears throat> and the purpose of these panels is really to talk to um, our full writers on their actual, the experience that they had, whether it's getting us some tips about how they went about um, applying in the first place, or whether it's, you know, understanding how this Fulbright Award has impacted their personal and professional um, development. So um, it's not going to be asking really specific questions um, such as eleg eligibility, um, but you do, if you do have specific questions, you can reach out to us. Um, most of the information will be in those um, that guidance that Sam sent around. Uh, sorry, where Sam showed you where it was on our website. Um, we will be updating that guidance um, in time for the August opening, um, but a lot of the information is still going to be very much the same. So you could definitely get a good idea of um, all of the different um, questions that you might have. So have a look on there, and if something's still not clear, please do reach out to us. So we're going to ask um, those of you interested in our scholar awards, um, so that's uh, those of you that have already done a PhD and are uh, perhaps uh, academic or professional looking to do research in the US, um, you're going to go into another room now with our, our scholar panellists. Um, I think a link has been sent round, hopefully, in the chat. Is that right? Sam, is, do you, can you confirm if the link's been shared with the whole group at this stage or Camilla? And those of you pursuing um, the postgraduate awards, if you stay put for now, um, and equally with the panelists, Shana and Lauren, if, if you stay put here, that'd be great. And we'll start in a moment. Okay, so the Scholar Award panel's now been shared. For those of you wanting to find out about the Scholar Awards, um, click on that link. And those of you uh, interested in the student awards, the postgraduate awards, stay put for a moment. Um, and then we're going to ask, uh, there we go, we've lost some people, so that's a good sign. We're going to ask Shana and Lauren, um, Camilla's going to make you co-hosts so that we can introduce you properly, hopefully. So if you, everyone could bear with us a moment while we... Okay, here we go. <clears throat> So um, Shana, while they get settled, um, hopefully they'll be sharing their video camera very soon. Um, Shana um, has just been given a Fulbright Award, so she's not gone to the US yet, but what's great about Shana is it will be very fresh. Um, you know, the whole, where you guys, what you guys are about to do now is, you know, start your research to go to the US and then start preparing to apply for a Fulbright Award. Um, that would be extremely fresh on Shana's mind and um, she might be able to share how she found the process. And we have Lauren who um, has been back in the UK for a while now as part of our Alumni Council. Um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves properly in a moment. Um, but Lauren will be talking more about um, what, A, her experience, the whole uh, going to the US, and um, but also what it's been like since she came back and how this experience impacted her more, more generally. Um, and there will be the opportunity for you to ask some questions in the chat, um, which I'll then be reading out to them. Um, but just bear in mind, as I said, it, it won't be too detailed or orientated. This is more about their, their experience of the process and to try and learn from that. So um, I think I'm going to start with Lauren to, to sort of do a high level overview of, of how this has all been. So if you wouldn't mind introducing uh, who you are, what you did, and then um, touch upon the points we, we talked about, and then we'll come to Shana afterwards, and then we'll go to questions. Yep, super. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so hi, I am Lauren. Um, I did my Fulbright postgraduate 2012 to 2014. I did a professional master's at the University of Southern California in public diplomacy, so I was based in Los Angeles. Um, do you want me to go in a little bit about my experience or do you want me just to stop there for my intro? Um, no, go, go for it, Lauren. Just, yeah. Okay, awesome. 
Uh, wonderful. Um, so uh, my uh, obviously I was there for two years as part of like my, my actual study, um, but I ended up being there for about three and a half years in total. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit because it's one of the benefits of the program as well, um, is that you are able to uh, conduct something called oc uh, occupational practical training. Um, but I wanted to kind of I probably could take five minutes on the crazy stories from Los Angeles, to be honest, like the celebrity stories that are cool, like Kevin Bacon or the embarrassing ones, like asking uh, Courtney Cox what she did for a living. Um, but I will not do that. Um, what I will do is I would just want to cover four main areas um, that I think are big benefits of being part of the Fulbright program and also studying um, in the States as well. Uh, the first thing is the mindset change. Um, this sounds very airy fairy and like it's not really that big of a deal um but honestly the mindset mindset shift that you experience um both as part of the Fulbright program and studying for whether it's a year or two years or however long you'll be there for um it really can't be underestimated um in the lead up to leaving we did a uh, piece of training on cult culture shock now I have lived in many different countries I have studied in many different countries in different languages um and I laughed at the culture shock bit because I was like why why would that be a thing you know going to the states but watch American TV it's all fine I've I've interned in Washington DC it's fine um and uh it's a, it's really massive <laughs> it's a really really big um culture shock and that can be challenging um but on the flip side there is the positive side of that culture shock because it, it takes you out of your um it takes you out of your comfort zone and you start to analyze and look at things very very differently um so that's the first area that i would say um the second area is the college experience in the us um it is very different again there is that culture change um but in terms of the way that us universities and colleges operate goes way past your degree. Um, I have studied, at, like I mentioned, in a few different universities and there's there's never been the experience of um, this kind of like long-term networking links. People see that you went to USC and they automatically will recommend you for certain jobs or will automatically like back you for certain things. So that's like a really, really big thing as well. It also makes you stand out massively when you go back to the UK to say that you studied in the States as well. Um, so that would be the second area. The third area is something called um, occupational practical training. So um, one of the things to think about is this isn't just studying abroad or uh, doing you know a degree abroad or things like that there's also the opportunity to stay on and um, conduct training with an organization so for me I interned with an organization during my degree and then as a result of that they offered me a limited placement for 18 months where I was able to go in and put my public diplomacy training to work and build a department for them focused on public diplomacy work that was an incredible experience that I didn't know I was going to have until even the last couple of months of my Fulbright. Um, and to be able to work in the States and then transfer that back to the UK is, is really, really, really fantastic. And it gives you a whole different um, way of looking at things and also networks. Like, for instance, that organization are not one of my biggest clients for my current company. Um, so it does kind of last. And we're talking now, like, what, almost a decade on. And then the last area I wanted to mention was the Fulbright Network. Um, so Amy mentioned there as well, I am on the Fulbright um, UK Alumni Council. Um, I have been for the past, I think, three to four years. Uh, I also mark applications as well um, and do things like this. Um, but the network that you have and the access to that platform, the, the Fulbrighter platform, to be able to travel to other countries and if, say, for instance, you're going to work somewhere else and be able to meet up with other Fulbrighters. Um, if you're conducting research long term and you're looking for people to give advice, things like that as well, you've, you've got a network for life. So you've got the Fulbright network, your US college network, your friends that you meet there, um, and maybe Kevin Bacon. So I will stop there. Thanks so much, Sharon. We'll, we'll inevitably have some questions to you in a moment. Um, and Shona, thanks so much for joining us. So we've thrown you in the deep end here because you, <coughs> you, you've only just recently found out that you have the Fulbright Scholarship, let alone actually um, gone out to the US at the moment. But, but what your information is invaluable. So what I want to 
understand is how you found out about Fulbright, why you decided to apply, you know, how you went about it, any any bits of information, because you've obviously done it successfully, that you might be able to share with some of the people in the room that are interested in, in doing something similar. Sure. Um, so I'm Shana. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope this can be useful for you because yeah, I've only just finished it all off. So I have received the Fulbright All Disciplines Award and I will be attending Columbia to study my master's in human rights studies in about two months. Uh, so it's all very exciting. Um, so I'm gonna touch on, like Amy said, why the US, how I chose my program, my university, why I decided on Fulbright and the general kind of application process. Um, so it kind of started off in my final year of undergraduate studies where I realized that my undergrad dissertation uh, was just the tip of the iceberg and there was so much more research I wanted to do um, when I was looking into how accountability processes following genocide could better serve the needs of local communities. So I realized that UK courses were not really reflecting my research interests, which were quite specific and very specialized, whereas the US courses I was looking at online had greater flexibility and more scope to explore my topic in a more holistic way because it sits at the bridge of a lot of um, different disciplines. Um, so I wanted to study in an international setting. I knew that from the beginning um, because I wanted that cultural exchange with fellow students who had experience in a range of human rights settings. So the biggest thing for me was that I had a clear I was quite clear on what I wanted out of my master's, which meant that when I was then looking at how to choose my program and my university, I was able to narrow down on courses pretty quickly. There's not many places, not many universities offered the specialization in transitional justice um, that I was looking for. So I also used recommendations from my lecturers and just, you know, basic Google searches. So it was quite a quite a long process. It took me maybe three or four months to really get to grips with what I wanted. Um, but I knew that I wanted a master's that valued the input and acquired knowledge of career professionals as well um, as academics. So not just people researching for a research purpose, but who had worked in um, conflict and post-conflict settings and had a lot of field-based experience. And I found that within Columbia. Um, so just linking back to something that was said in the main presentation, when you're doing the application itself, you're really asked to narrow down on why you've chosen that program and that university. And I found that starting my search based off of the program itself, rather than the university, helped me to avoid the pitfall of just having a big name university and not really knowing what I was looking for or why I was there other than seeing it in like Legally Blonde or something. Um, and in terms of how I decided on Fulbright um, and how I knew of Fulbright, it was kind of one of those names like the Rhodes Scholarship that was thrown around. You vaguely know of it, um, but I really dug into it over the summer. So kind of where a lot of you are now. Um, and I was aware that the Fulbright program was big and seemed incredibly ambitious and was quite daunting. Um, but I took the attitude that if I wanted um, to have a chance at getting the Fulbright scholarship, I had to at least apply, even if it was a 1% chance. Um, and that meant just being honest in my application about my journey so far and what I wanted out of a US um, postgraduate experience and doing myself justice on paper. So the application process itself is fairly straightforward. Um, you know, you have your online biographical information and then the main bits for the postgraduate application with a research statement talking about why you've chosen your university and um, what you're going to be studying. And if you know the postgraduate thesis you'll be writing, you go into depth on that there. And then there's also the personal statement, which is more holistic, I think, than the postgraduate applications we do in the UK for graduate school because it's more about who you are as a person, your journey to this point and why you'd be a good fit for the Fulbright program. So it's it's a little bit more, yeah, it's broader. Um, so for me, like I said, it was straightforward, but I found it pretty challenging personally um, because it required me to reflect on who I was and the impact I wanted to have both through my studies and in my career. And 
for me, that was something I hadn't really considered in those terms up to this point. So the Fulbright program, sorry, the Fulbright application, by the end of it, I felt like I knew what I was working towards through my research and in a wider sense, in a much clearer terms by the end of it. Um, and as I think everybody on the call understands, the US for postgraduate study is expensive, but Fulbright is more than just a pot of money. Um, and that's what I really appreciated about the application. It gives you the opportunity to really think about what the ethos and the goals are of Fulbright, how you reflect these and how you can contribute through your own work to that broader ethos. Um, so like I said, the, it's kind of big questions and it requires a lot of time. So the earlier you start, the better. So if you're on this call, you're on the, on the right lines, um, but just take your time with it and do your research. So whether that's on the course, the university, what you're looking for, but also what the Fulbright program is. And for finding that information, the Fulbright website is your best bet. And also looking on the bios of previous Fulbrighters and just doing a bit of digging as to what they're doing, um, the original, kind of goals of Fulbright and why the commission was set up, why cultural exchange is important. And if you do that work, then you're definitely on the right tracks. Um, but yeah, that's all for me. Wonderful, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate that, Shana, and uh, everything you said rang very true. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in, um, probably um, more for myself, I'm just going to um, answer and then I do, we do have a question for you guys. So um, just to quickly answer a couple of questions here. One was related to the success rate of applications. I don't have that um, any data with me today and can't comment on, on uh, like the stats of our application process. But what I can say is that the All Discipline Award, so the one that Shana was talking about, is um, more competitive because obviously because it's so broad, it applies to a lot more people. These are people that want to apply in any, any subject in uh, any US university. But if you look up partner awards and you find one that does fit what you're trying to do, um, like strategically, um, it's going to apply to a smaller pool of people. So um, it's, it's not as competitive. So you might want to explore those. Um, and we've also had one about um, a repeat applicant who um, was asking if they'd get feedback from last year. And first of all, yes, you can reapply. We, you can apply as many times as you like. We, we definitely applaud um, someone coming back each year because it is competitive and we're turning really strong people away each year. Um, um, and it's probably best, I I'm not sure they'd be able to comment on last year's application, but if you speak to the team um, to, to try and get more information in general in, in the preparation of applying this year, then uh, they'll be as helpful as possible. It's, it's difficult for us to give everybody um, special, specific feedback on their particular application because of the volume applications. Okay. Um, so um, one question uh, both for both Lauren and Shana is um, in relation to uh, the relationships you developed with the US universities <clears throat> before and during your Fulbright. So whether you reached out to make contact with them and what the kind of, how that went basically, um, whether, whether they were very responsive to you, whether you had to be pers per persevere um, and just basically how that dialogue happened. And then perhaps Lauren, you can also comment on, on what the relationship was like once you got there and, and what that kind of um, dynamic is with faculty and supervisors. Um, I'll start with Shana, if that's okay. I, I know you may, I don't, I genuinely don't know how it works um, in terms of building those connections. It's been a very long time since I did this. So over to you, Shana. Um, so I actually didn't reach out to Columbia itself before, sorry, there's a plane going over there, uh, before I applied. Uh, what I did do is I identified two professors at Columbia beforehand and tried to reach out to them through LinkedIn um, just to get an idea of whether the there was enough of a focus on transitional justice at Columbia. Uh, one of them responded, so I guess that's a pretty good 50% response rate. Um, but I would say if you don't if you don't get a response at first, definitely persist because I've spoken to other um, other people who have applied to US study and they have said that when they are able to send emails over, they generally get a response because they want to help you as much as possible, make the right decision for you. But yeah. Lauren, how did it work for you? 
Mine was, oh, just before I say that, to the person who asked about applying for the second time, uh, there were people in my year who had applied to three times and had been accepted. Um, and so I would encourage you to do it again. And also as someone who marks the applications, when someone writes and says why the second time they're applying again, I'm always really impressed by that. So just if that's a little bit of encouragement for you on that one. Um, yeah, so uh, for me, the process is a little bit different because there was another organization involved at the time because this was 2011 yes yeah, so 10 years ago um so it was a little bit different um and i did have a little bit of frustration because i couldn't get direct emails um but what actually happened for me which i was very fortunate in is um a couple of the universities contacted me when I applied um, and one of them was the director of the program that I ended up going to um, and so that was really really good. Um, one of the things that can be quite frustrating, although I'm sure it actually will be this coming year etc, um, was that there wasn't such thing as like there weren't webinars, there weren't virtual tours of campus, there weren't, you know, which is going to be different for you when you apply because there, there's going to be a lot of that. Um, in fact, I did one a couple of weeks ago um, as well. So, uh, yeah, that was a little bit frustrating, but um, when I asked the universities for more information, they had phone calls with me or sent me videos and things like that. And as well, I think it was a good sign that I was that interested that I wanted to have that interaction as well. Um, and then since I've left, uh, my the director of the program who sent me that email is now my mentor. Um, and uh, I talk to quite regularly. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we're still very much in contact. Um, last year, the university profiled me for one of their online media things. Um, so I'm still in contact with um, the alumni network there as well. Um, and I mean, USC is a massive university, massive. Um, so there's alumni associations for like every everything. Um, so I still get uh, a lot of kind of contact and things like that as well. And because I interned on campus uh, once or twice, I think during mine, um, whenever I'm in Los Angeles as well, I get some time with uh, former colleagues and stuff, which is really lovely too. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, we have a question about from someone um, saying that they're, they're interested in, um, they want to apply for global affairs, which is very broad. And how should they talk about that in their research objective in their application and it'd be interesting to see if you guys have any suggestions um but from my perspective um the you, if you I'm, I'm assuming that you have a particular global affairs program in mind uh which may be broad in itself um but if if not then um perhaps you can comment to correct me but um ultimately we just want to know why you want to do that what's the long-term goal here um, you know, what have you done previously, which will prepare you well for that course? Why, what attracts you, what it is about the particular programme um, and perhaps the university as well, um, and what you hope to do with that once you um, have finished. And that's essentially the ingredients we're looking for. Um, it's, you know, to, to make it clear that you have some kind of trajectory. It's okay for that trajectory to change. We have a lot of fullbrighters go to the US, come back and decide to do something completely different with something that they've picked up at the US. Um, that's okay, but at this stage, we're, we're expecting some focus with, with what you want to do. And that will only come from doing a lot of research and really a bit um, uh, deep reflection on, on what you're doing now and how, how, how this might work out for you. Um, so do you have anything to add to that, Lauren and Shana, on that front? I'd say from my perspective, having having read the, when I read that applications, if it sounds like you just want to go study in America because you want to go study in America, which fair, but that that's not, and you've just picked a program and yeah, you're into global affairs, but that's not what you're like, that that's just it then that's not going to go very far but yes it might be a broad program but again it is why you want to do it um i'm always really impressed when people reference part of the curriculum that they've looked it up that they you know are particularly interested in this class or this professor what you want to do when you come back or what your trajectory is is very very important as well um but um i, I would assume if that's the the course you want to do you've got a good reason so put your why in there and um yeah, that will come through really strongly um, too. And just to just to clarify that in the postgraduate applications, not everybody already has their research focus laid out when they're applying. Um, 
your thesis component, I believe, for all courses comes right at the end of your year or two years of study. Um, so it's okay to take time. You're supposed to spend the year developing it and fleshing it out. So even if it is a broad program like Global Affairs, there's a reason you're interested in that. And that is what I presume uh, the Fulbright Commission wants to see. So don't be afraid of not knowing right at this moment exactly what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. This is this is why we started really early uh, in the in the process for you to start to pin some of that stuff down and, and, and think about it and do some research and talk to people, talk to as many people as you can. As I said, we're going to have some alums. Um, so we're actually not alums, but some current people that are in the US at the moment. Um, then we're just setting it up on a website for you to be able to reach out and ask them questions. Um, you, you know, we can probably try and connect you as well through the Fulbright Commission with alums. So if you don't know people already that have been through the Fulbright program, let us know and we can try and put you in touch to get more advice. Um, we had a really good question about the number of app, number of universities that you can apply for, and it's very normal in the US to apply for multiple universities. And at, this, at the time of your Fulbright application, it's it's also completely um, normal to have several candidates, if you like, of um, programs, universities, all similar in nature that should ideally be going in a very similar direction. Um, but that's okay. So, Shana and Lauren, did you apply for more than one university? Yeah. So could you? No, you didn't, Shana. You 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 were you were very. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Well, it's just about you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I only applied to Columbia because I was so like adamant that was the 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 right course. Um, but that is pretty odd. I think most people apply for two or three at least. Yeah. I love that. And that gives me goosebumps, by the way. That is that is great. Um, that's how you know you're supposed to be doing something. Um, I had to actually at the time, the way um, it was set up was I had to apply to um, five uh, universities. Um, and strangely enough, I thought I knew the university that I wanted to go to and the course I wanted to do. And um, Fulbright at the time was working with another organization and they recommended uh, this course at USC and I didn't I wasn't interested I didn't want to go to Los Angeles I was like meh um, and it ended up I looked at it and just knew instantly that that was the course I, I was supposed to do um, so yeah but I did have um, I got offers from four out of five of the ones I applied to um, and all of them as well one of the things I know um, my biggest concern and my biggest issue was the funding um, and uh, I don't think it's any secret that this the Fulbright scholarship is not going to cover everything especially if you're going for two years um, and if you the universities when they see Fulbright on your application usually will offer you um, funding as well so that was something that I had gone through to um, with each university is what their scholarship offer was um, things like that as well. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it's it's perfectly normal in the US to have several candidates and hopefully receive as many offers from your like, primary choices as possible. And then, as Lauren says, then almost negotiate with them to try and get uh, the most attractive package. Um, and the other thing to mention, which Lauren touched upon, is it's absolutely worthwhile to mention that you're planning to apply for Fulbright and then if you're shortlisted at any stage sharing that because the Fulbright um, program is, is is huge in the US and it opens a lot of doors um, for our Fulbrighters to go in US once, once you start mentioning that um, and US universities really want to host British Fulbrighters so please do um, use the name as much as you need to. If I can add to that just before you move on as well, um, just you said about negotiating with the universities, you can you can do that. Um, I actually was going to turn down my Fulbright 24 hours before I had to let the university know because I couldn't get the funding to cover like the extra year. And I spoke to the university and they waived all of my fees um, 24 hours before I was like had to make it in my mind up. So you can go back to the universities and explain how much you need and they will move on it as well. I pretty much did the same thing. After I got the award, I was adamant that I needed funding and I haven't been offered any from Columbia. So I went back and wrote them like a full page out on what I'd been doing in my year since graduating. And they then offered me a 50% scholarship. So it, it works. Um, um, so we have a question, uh, would you be able to say more about targeting your Fulbright application to the US rather than the UK? For example, I'm interested in law and public health. The US public health uh, is more, far more developed than in the UK. And would it strengthen my application to map what I've, 
I might learn and how that will allow me to develop moving forward. I guess the first part I can answer in um, just bear in mind that when you're applying for the Fulbright Award, you're applying to us at the US UK Fulbright Commission. Um, which to be fair, our staff and also our reading panelists are going to be a mixture of American and UK um, uh, alums and experts in the field. Um, but when you're applying to the US, US university, that's a separate application process and, and you should be reading the guidelines on, on the US university's website about uh, what, what they're looking for essentially. Um, so there's not really an expectation for you to pitch it to a US audience um, or a UK audience, just I guess, um, I think what would be interested is we'd want to know about that difference between the US and UK and your understanding of that. We'd want to know how, the, how you might bring that, bring that knowledge back to the UK to hopefully benefit the UK. Um, but the second part, will it strengthen my application to map what I might learn and how that will allow me to develop moving forward? Um, Lauren and Shana, do you remember how you approached your essays and then how you were going to write your application in that respect? I started with an example about Mickey Mouse. Um, so that's probably, I don't know if you want to compare that with uh, your uh, public health. Um, but yeah, because um, one of the things that I had to talk about in my application particularly was um, like why why the United States, why why was that something like that I wanted to do and what I would learn there compared to somewhere else. For instance, say for instance, if it was a program like Global Affairs, you can study that in different places. So why that? why that area, why that college, why that um, that that zone. Um, but the other thing I had to show was why America would be a different experience for me. So I mentioned that I'd only ever had Mickey Mouse experience in America, in Disney World as a kid. Um, so yeah, but I think that even just the way you asked your question, I would say you're already approaching it in the right way. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, anything you can do to map to show why this would be important to you or different, uh, offer you something different. And also if you wanted to map it back to the uh, UK too. Um, so one thing that we always look for when we're mapping things out is people having a commitment to um, taking their, whatever they learn back to the UK. So um, I think you could map it the whole way through. Okay, anything to add? Not much to be honest, but I've just pulled up my research statement that I submitted um, and I focused a lot on what I would get out of New York as a location and that also helped me to explain why Columbia um, but I was talking about the opportunity for New York as a human rights center especially with the Security Council based out of New York um, and what else did I talk about? About the NGOs that are headquartered there um, that may not have a presence in the UK. Um, so yeah, just, just really honing down and being specific about not just the US, but if you can think about why you've chosen like that geographical location over, you know, East Coast, West Coast, for example, that would help. And just remember that the guidelines that we referenced earlier, um, they go into quite a lot of detail about each part of the application and what we're looking for. So do, um, we try to make it really clear. We, we really try not to make this a mystery. We want you to succeed. We want you to, we want you to show us your best self um, and what you're trying to do. There's no um, secrets or uh, hidden traps here. And if you're not sure what something means, you can't reach out to us and ask us because we, we'd have to explain it um, as clearly as we possibly can. Um, one, we've, we've run out of time now, believe it or not. So um, we are gonna draw to a close, but there's just one more thing I wanted to really stress. Um, and that's if the Fulbright Awards are typically a contribution to uh, the cost of a US education. Um, and quite often there's gonna be a gap that needs to be funded. Um, and if that, once you do uh, some of the initial budget, um, if that's off-putting for you and, and you, you know, you're not going to pursue this, um, I would really strongly recommend that you um, really look at all of the options in the US because um, the money can go a lot further in certain places and certain universities, really, really good universities with fantastic um, programs. And um, it's quite easy to gravitate to some of the well-known famous universities, but often they're the most expensive. And also the cost of living in the area 
varies massively across the US. So just bear that in mind, don't be put off straight away if you're looking at some of the um, more expensive cities and more expensive universities and you think, you know, you can't do it because you'd be really surprised. And as mentioned earlier, um, as also once you actually are on the, the kind of Fulbright ladder, if you like, um, that's, you know, a, a university in the US isn't attracting that many British students, but um, it's a fantastic university here's of a British Fulbrighter, you know, they're probably going to work hard to make sure that you follow through and go. Um, so just bear that in mind, there are ways to be quite entrepreneurial about it. Um, so as I mentioned, we have more events coming where, as I said, we will do a deeper dive into eligibility and, and how you can try and make your application more uh, as competitive as possible. Um, uh, but at this stage, we just want you to research the US, go out do as much research as possible, think about who you are, what you want to do, um, and be willing to, to basically share with us. And, and one final thing is that when we're looking at bringing a cohort of British um, students together, uh, we want it to be a really diverse cohort um, from people from all over the UK, from all different backgrounds, doing different things, and hopefully going to all different parts of the US. So um, please be prepared to uh, tell us what you're going to bring to the table and what you're going to contribute to that cohort uh, because we really want to hear that in your application and, and be, use this time to be reflecting on, on what pits about your background and what you're trying to do you want to um, build into your application so this is a chance for you to think research ask questions um, and we'll go into more detail at, at later for events but thank you Lauren and Shana really appreciate it um, really helpful to hear some of your tips um, and thank you everybody for stepping out the first week of sunshine that we've had this summer um, and you've joined us at our webinar so we're really grateful that you came along and we wish you good luck in the process and you'll be hearing from us again soon bye everybody bye